Hello, everybody. My name is Jeff Donnell, and I'm president of Enterprise Health. And I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, which is going to focus on the role that COVID testing plays in keeping your employee population healthy and safe. Uh, I'm going to be moderating today's session. Uh, and we have a, a wonderful slate of speakers with us from uh, a company called DrugScan uh, that we've started to partner with uh, on behalf of several of our clients. Just to give you a little bit of context about Enterprise Health, this is uh, this is our elevator pitch for uh, for those of us who now feel safe enough to ride in an elevator with other people. Uh, and we're the only cloud-based health IT solution that combines occupational health and compliance, clinical care, and employee engagement on a single, interoperable, certified electronic health record platform. And we focus on equipping our enterprise clients and their employees for a healthier future. Now, we work with a wide mix of blue-chip global corporations, government agencies and hospitals and health systems who operate their own on-site employee health clinics and provide employee health services to other organizations. Now, just a couple of housekeeping items for today. Uh, we've muted everyone except for our moderators and our panelists uh, on entry to minimize background noise. We are recording the session, so we will email everyone a link in a few days so you can access the recording and share it. And today's panelists have really been immersed in all things COVID for going on now almost two years. So we have a frontline perspective on the importance of testing as part of a COVID management strategy. So I'm going to take a little bit of time to provide some context. Uh, and then our panelists from DrugScan are going to talk more about their organizations and their insight on COVID testing. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. So along the way, you can submit questions uh, via the Q&A feature in WebEx, and then at the end, we'll get to as many of those as we possibly can. I know the webinar is scheduled to run 90 minutes. I'm not sure if it'll take that long today, but uh, you know, we, we plan to move through the, uh, through the material pretty quickly here, uh, respecting everybody's time. I really don't have to remind anybody on this call uh, about what a wild ride the last 20 plus months have been. And the image that you're looking at on the screen is a roller coaster car from Space Mountain. So for those of you who have not been on this ride at Disney Park, it actually takes place in the dark. So you really can't see the next curve, the next hill, the next twist or turn. But because it's a Disney ride, you know it's gonna be fun, you know it's gonna be safe, and you know it's gonna be over in exactly two and a half minutes. Now the COVID coaster uh, has been similarly unpredictable, and it certainly feels like we've been hurtling through the dark and subjected to a nonstop barrage of surges and variances and, and ever-changing and often conflicting guidance, uh, mandates, different requirements, uh, not to mention a healthy dose of misinformation and partisan sniping and fear and rancor. Now, unlike a well-engineered and well-maintained Disney ride, uh, the COVID coaster feels a lot more rickety, a lot more unsafe, and, and you get the impression that there are, are pieces of track missing along the way. And vaccine mandates have certainly been a part of this uh, very wild ride. And last year, um, late last year, it appeared that the United States was going to be subjected to three different government mandates that would in, in, end up impacting almost every employer organization of, of any size. There was the OSHA ETS mandate, which would require vaccinations or regular testing for companies with more than 100 employees. Then there's the CMS healthcare mandate, which would require vaccinations for workers at healthcare facilities that accept Medicare or Medicaid funding. And then there's the safer federal agency mandate, which would require vaccinations for anyone employed at a government agency as well as contractors and subcontractors working with those agencies. Not to mention individual employers who decided to make vaccination a term of employment, regardless of whether a mandate applies. Now, over the latter half of last year, I know we worked with most of our clients to gear up for these mandates to be ready. Uh, we configured Enterprise Health to manage vaccination status, uh, enabling employees to do things like complete status questionnaires, 
upload proof of vaccination, complete exemption request forms. Uh, we helped our clients track and manage their employee populations and develop mechanisms to be able to manage regular testing for any unvaccinated employees who might qualify for a medical or religious exemption. And I know as, as our organization works with a number of government agencies as a contractor and a subcontractor, we actually had to experience firsthand the complex challenge of tracking and managing employee vaccine status for ourselves. So enterprise health employees were able to use our software to provide information, upload pictures of their vaccine cards, that sort of thing. So after helping our clients navigate all of this for, uh, for about 20 months, uh, late last year, we got a firsthand taste of what all of you have been facing. And I have to say, uh, it gave us a new appreciation uh, for the challenge and, uh, you know, and was certainly humbling. Now, I think everybody knows that immediately after all of these mandates were announced, the legal challenges immediately ensued. So there were uh, a number of challenges, uh, a number of lawsuits filed, and after they worked their way through the lower courts, um, the OSHA ETS and CMS mandates were recently reviewed by the US Supreme Court. And the result of that is that the OSHA ETS mandate is now off the table. However, the CMS mandate for healthcare uh, entities uh, stands. And then as far as the safer government agency mandate, it actually was not reviewed by the Supreme Court. Uh, but from everything we're seeing, kind of the, the prevailing legal wisdom is that it would follow the, the same route of the OSHA ETS if it were to make its way to the highest court. So it appears that it's probably a non-starter as well. Now, I will say that we scheduled and planned this webinar prior to the Supreme Court weighing in on all of this. So back then it looked like every organization with more than 100 employees was gonna need to have a testing strategy in place for any unvaccinated employee. So clearly the landscape has changed, but we really shouldn't assume that the importance of testing has changed all that much. So just a little brief history of testing. Uh, and I think we all know that, that COVID testing has changed dramatically in the last 20 months. Uh, and of course, we're, we're all now very well acquainted with the nasal swab. Uh, and even though that thing is, is really only a few inches long, uh, it, it certainly seems or perhaps feels like it's about 17 feet long when, uh, when you've got it stuck up your nose. Um, and, and I think we all saw that early in the pandemic, there was a, a big push to rapidly develop, manufacture and deploy COVID tests. And in hindsight, Initial tests were were developed relatively quickly. It didn't take all that long before uh, there was there was some some testing capability out there. Uh, although it certainly took took some time to scale up uh, both test volumes and then to be able to set up kind of the large scale infrastructure that you need to be able to to test Americans widely. Um, in addition, uh, the efficacy of some of those early tests was certainly questionable at best. But once tests were available, uh, there was pressure to ramp up testing capacity quickly. Uh, and I think we all recall footage of cars lined up for hours at drive-through testing sites. Uh, and, and I'm sure some of us had to, uh, to actually endure some of that. But over time, we, we finally reached a point where it seemed like tests were readily available. Uh, At-home point of care tests were in abundant supply on, on drugstore and grocery store shelves. Uh, getting an appointment for a PCR test was relatively easy. Uh, in fact, you could you know do it at the drive-through at uh, at many pharmacy locations. Then, uh, sort of a surprise, late in the game, late last year, early this year, we got hit with an Omicron wave, and all of a sudden we were we were kind of back to the future, with tests in short supply. Uh, I think we're aware that the U.S. government has responded with a commitment to get hundreds of millions of tests produced. Uh, they created a website where every household can, household can go on and, and order at-home tests. And we're likely going to catch up somewhere, but uh, unfortunately, it'll probably be at, a, at, at the point where we no longer need the tests, at least for Omicron. Although, it's going to be really good to have that inventory if and when we get hit with a new uh, a new variant wave. And 
those images of people waiting in line for hours, uh, you know, many, many miles to get testing, uh, those images have returned. Uh, and, and this is happening again. Uh, and it's kind of a kind of an appropriate visual for uh, for for Groundhog Day for sure. Now, our experience at uh, at at Enterprise Health has kind of kind of mapped this overall history, uh, and and really our experience has evolved uh, as this pandemic has has evolved. Now, early on, uh, some of our clients were leaders; they were out there uh, on the bleeding edge in terms of establishing frontline testing modalities. Um, one of our clients, pharma company Lilly, uh, actually set up drive-through testing. They were one of the first to do this very early in the pandemic, uh, primarily for healthcare workers. They wanted to help get those individuals access to testing before it was widely available. Um, in the in the oil and gas space, another client of ours, Philip sixty six, very early on uh, was able to source and secure an inventory of rapid tests. Uh, and it was part of their strategy to be able to keep essential workers on the job. And they actually uh, tested employees on site and then test results along with a photo of the, of the test cassette and its results were uploaded into the enterprise health solution. Of course, today, most of our clients have electronic lab interfaces in place and all of those interfaces have been updated to support electronic orders and results for COVID testing streamlines the whole process uh, from, from ordering to getting results, uh, minimizing data entry, all those sorts of things. Most recently, what we're seeing is that a number of our clients have been working with us to support employee self-testing at home using rapid point of care tests. And in many cases, that testing is being conducted with a proctor uh, from the client employee health services team. So they set up a, a what amounts to a virtual appointment and then use the telehealth capabilities that are embedded in the enterprise health solution to enable the proctor to really oversee the administration of the at-home test and the collection of results. And of course, here most recently in, in light of recent vaccine mandate rulings, uh, our client response has been really all over the board. We have some clients who've said, yeah, you know what, we're, we're, we're gonna put a hold on testing. We'll put those testing plans on the shelf. Uh, we have other clients who kind of thought about it and said, you know what, we're going to proceed full steam ahead. We're, we still want to make sure that we have good testing measures in place. Uh, and that's certainly the case for our health system and hospital clients who are still subjected to the, uh, the CMS mandate. Uh, we have some clients that test unvaccinated employees periodically. Uh, or they, they use testing uh, to uh, be able to manage recently exposed or ill employees as part of a return to work strategy. Um, we even have a client that tests uh, any employee who works in a lab setting every single day. So, you know, the, the, the testing landscape is, uh, is unbelievably fluid, uh, just, just like things have been really throughout this pandemic. So let's talk about, uh, about what now. And really, you know, regardless of mandate status, COVID testing is still a major pillar of the COVID response strategy, uh, along with other measures like vaccines, like wearing masks, like social distancing. And really, if anything, if we've learned anything uh, over the, the relatively short history of COVID, uh, we know that, that easing our, our foot up on the testing gas pedal at a certain point was a mistake. And it turned out we were left with inadequate testing capacity for the Omicron surge. And now today in the healthcare sector, where again, that CMS vaccine mandate is in effect, having a good testing strategy is essential. And most of our health system clients have prepared for this. Uh, you know, they're ready for it. They, they need to be able to manage unvaccinated employees and, and be able to test them uh, at regular intervals. Uh, in many cases, again, we're seeing that individual employers that aren't subject to a mandate have gone ahead and elected to require uh, employee vaccines anyway and make that a term of employment. Uh, and, and certainly these organizations have set up testing workflows as appropriate. And then, you know, even if you set kind of the vaccine topic aside, uh, there are many other scenarios where testing, you know, has to play a, a critical role going forward. Uh, for example, business travel. 
Um, and, and we are seeing organizations say, okay, well, when it comes to international travel uh, or, or even, you know, routine business travel domestically, uh, we, we want to make sure that we have a proper testing regimen in place. Uh, and, and a lot of that, too, is mandated depending on where you're traveling and, and what their requirements are. We're, we're also seeing the testing, you know, remains important for returning employees to work. After they've had a bout with COVID or they've had COVID exposure and really for managing uh, employee populations in general. We're also seeing that the testing strategies vary somewhat by industry. For example, we have clients involved in food processing and they see testing as extremely important. And a lot of that has to do with working conditions where people are working, you know, shoulder to shoulder. Uh, in, for example, a, you know, a, a, a meat processing plan, whereas in some of our white collar clients, there's, there's a little bit different attitude. So it really, uh, it really does depend to, uh, to some degree, uh, you know, what, what industry uh, you're in. Uh, also, uh, at home testing continues to grow more pre prevalent. Uh, I know this past holiday season, many, many families relied on point of care testing to determine. Is it safe to gather? You know, who who are we going to allow in our house? Uh, I know personally, my wife and I conducted uh, I think three different at home tests over the last uh, month and a half or so, either after exposure to people who tested positive for COVID and called us to tell us about it, or after we had some COVID like symptoms. Uh, and you know, while while we tested negative all three times. Um, you know, we, we also uh, wonder about the, uh, the, the efficacy and the sensitivity and specificity of those at home tests and, and, and were they really accurate? Um, but again, you know, this, this pandemic has proven to be very, very unpredictable. Uh, none of us really knows for sure what lurks around the next corner. Uh, and when it comes to testing, it absolutely makes sense to have a good strategy in place. Uh, with the understanding that we, that we just have to remain agile, responsive, and and really prepared for every contingency. Now, over the the course of this pandemic, one of the constant refrains that we've heard from our clients is frustration with uh, access to accurate and rapid COVID test results. And early on, it wasn't particularly surprising that there were delays in getting COVID testing in place. And getting results back in a timely manner. Again, it, it took everybody time to to scale up and to react to uh, you know this once in a generation pandemic. Um, however, we're seeing that in some cases these problems have, have persisted. You know, even now, almost two years into this thing. So you know, while we're all used to supply supply chain challenges these days, there there's a distinct difference between having to wait on new kitchen cabinets and having to wait on critical COVID test results. Our clients have certainly placed a premium on finding lab partners who've been able to rise to this challenge. Uh, I know our organization has been focused on being very agile and responsive over the course of this crisis, and we certainly value partner organizations who operate in a similar manner. Um, now, we were fortunate to get introduced to drug scan actually through one of our newer clients, uh, Rochester Regional Health, and that's a health system in New York State. And, um, and we've, we've got, we got introduced together and, and have worked together. They've been great to work with, uh, very easy to interface with, uh, and, and very responsive uh, to their client community. So uh, we've asked them to talk a little bit today about testing from their vantage point. You know, what is it that they're seeing, uh, you know, as, as a, uh, a lab vendor? Uh, and we're joined today by uh, their Western U.S. regional leader, Aaron Mark, uh, and their business unit manager, uh, Matt Robel. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop sharing, and I will turn over control to Aaron. Well, Jeff, I appreciate the introduction. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, I am the Western Regional um, Manager. So basically I cover the entire Western portion of the United States. Um, fortunate for me, I would, didn't have to travel this week because I'm snowed in in the Midwest. So um, <clears throat> I'll be presenting to you guys today. So let's get started here. And, and as I go through this, um, if there's any questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask, or if you want, you can hold off to the end of the presentation. 
Um, so a little bit about DrugScan. Um, we are backed by the $2 billion Re Rochester Regional Health Network. Um, 35 years of laboratory um, leadership. Um, that was one of the things that attracted me to this company. I've been actually with DrugScan for over three years now. And I've been in this space. Um, obviously the COVID space is, is rather new, um, like Jeff alluded to, about 20 months into it. Um, but I've been in uh, this type of laboratory space for over 10 years. Um, our lab is CAP accredited in SAMHSA, which is important with, uh, for a lot of our customers. Um, we have a lot of customers that are um, uh, treatment centers, substance abuse treatment centers. And so that SAMHSA accreditation um, really helps us there. Uh, PhD board certified staff. Uh, we also had advanced testing platforms, including molecular, LCMS, LT, LD, TD, and GC, G, GSMS. Um, our laboratory is in operation 24 seven, which is big, especially since I, on the Western, uh, Western part of the United States have uh, a, a lot of people that are working late into the evening on the East Coast, since we're an East Coast company. And then upon receipt, 98% of the results are reported within uh, 20, 24 to 48 hours, which is very important for a lot of our customers, um, depending on what their needs are. Um, so how are we gonna keep your employees safe? We're gonna keep those employees safe through COVID-19 testing. And so one of the things we kind of talked about is why, is why testing is important. And it helps determine if an employee is infected regard, regardless of the symptoms. I have a lot of um, accounts that uh, test their employees regularly, and um, they've been successful at limiting a, a major outbreak and having to shut down their office or shut down their treatment center or long-term care facility um, because they're testing on a routine basis. So that helps out quite a bit. Uh, this will help slow and stop the spread. And then testing is the most effective way to isolate the infected. So your business can, can continue to run effectively. So what type of tests do we offer? Um, so the COVID-19 tests that, we are, that are available are the PCR test, which is the gold standard. Then you also have the antigen rapid tests, and then we're um, gonna be launching flu A and B. And I'm gonna jump back to the antigen rapid test. Jeff, you made a comment just kind of on the accuracy of those. And, and that's been the kind of the number one issue is people use these rapid tests and they come, come back negative and they're like, they're swearing they're positive. So that's why we kind of always go back to that PCR test because that that is, from a sensitivity and specificity standpoint, that is the gold standard. Um, again, what type of tests are available? So we have the PCR test, which is the uh, polymerase chain reaction. Um, and this is basically a molecular test that looks for genetic material from the virus, and it's all done in the lab. And what it does is it uses the chemicals to reproduce millions to billions of copies of the viral related DNA from a small sample. So basically it's, looking to find that DNA of that the virus and then amplifying it out, um, millions to billions of copies of it. It's considered a highly sensitive with very few false positives. And it's collected via, it's either a nasal pharyngeal, oral pharyngeal or saliva. Um, I think the best way to do it is the, is the na nasal pharyngeal. And like Jeff said, that I think that swab is, people think it's like 10 feet long. Um, or we have the rapid antigen test, and those are those instant tests we were talking about. So it's basically a lateral flow test that detects specific antigens. It searches for pieces of protein of the SARS-CoV-2 through the sample being treated with a reagent or analyzed on the spot. Has moderate to high sensitivity depending on the peak of the viral load. Sensitive, sensitivity is lower, which can cause false negatives and positives. And this is collected via either a nose swab or a, a throat swab. Um, types of specimen collection and turnaround time. So collections can occur on site, which is probably the best option. We can ship to a predetermined location. We can also do home, uh, ship to the home, or where you can have it shipped to the employee's home. Or we have a patient service center, one of many locations throughout the, the US. Um, so we can or if somebody's interested in uh, using our collections and, and our testing, we can work with um, the individual that's interested in using our services. 
And then turnaround time, I think this is one of the important, and this is one of the important factors that we have a lot of customers shifting away from big box labs and coming over to us is um, just the, one of the greatest factors that affects spread of infection um, is a slow turnaround time. Rapid tests will give results in 15 minutes. PCR tests will take 24 to 48 hours. And our lab processes samples in nine hours of receipt of the sample. So if you were to take samples today, we would ship them overnight. They would hit our lab in the morning. And once they hit, once they hit our lab and we receive it, we can usually get that um, result out within nine hours. So that initial 24 hours is just basically that shipping time. I have a lot of accounts, like I said, that ship from the West Coast and they're actually doing COVID samples today. We would probably have results for them by the end of the day tomorrow. So it's pretty, pretty fast turnaround time for a PCR test where um, I had a couple clients telling me that it was taken up to a week or 10 days to get their results back. And, and with the, um, <clears throat> by, the, by the time you quarantine and everything, you're out of the quarantine, you still haven't gotten your results back. So with us, it's usually within 24 to 48 hours. And like I said, we'll get that result out about nine hours after we receive it. And then basically a compliance man management solution. And that solution includes plan to collect samples via on-site or at home, dependent on what you, ne what you need, an app to capture uh, employee co uh, compliance. And so if you have you know, a, a big employee base, um, it'd probably be hard to track all of this. Um, you know, so the app is gonna make it easier to help uh, capture all of that. Um, data aggregation dashboard to collect employee vaccination and testing, a rapid test for quick confirmation of, the, of infection, a PCR test for symptomatic negative rapid tests, and then obviously we follow the CDC recommendations for quarantine and re return to work. And with that, I will hand it over to Matt, which we will touch base on his portion of, the, uh, of drug scan and DSI. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, nice to meet everybody. My name is Matt Robel. I work for a business unit within the drug scan world called uh, DSI Medical Services. Um, and the reason that drug scan has DSI is because when they work with employers, you know, by the time the specimen gets to the laboratory, there's a lot of other things that have happened, you know, prior to that point. Because uh, it's usually part of a much bigger process of a overall, uh, in our world, it's a lot of the drug and alcohol testing uh, that that's done for employers to help them with their, you know, not only their applicant screening, um, but also just sort of an overall philosophy of having a, you know, a drug and an alcohol free workplace. And there's so much that goes into having an effective program in, especially in this day and age when there's lots of, uh, you know, different laws, both on the federal level, on the state level, there's the marijuana issues, there's, you know, safety sensitive issues, and there's different types of tests, and there's different specimens, and there's different levels of accuracy and different, um, you know, uses, depending on the type of sample that you're using. And employers, a lot of times, just don't have any idea of, of how to pull all of that into together it, into a program that meets their needs, creates the safe environment, but more importantly, minimizes the disruption to the operation to perform such testing. So DSI was founded as a way to help companies and help workplaces manage those other aspects of running an effective drug and alcohol testing program and background check and background applicant background screening program for employers. Um, you know, really sort of taking that high tech, high touch uh, mentality to it, to really understand the business, understand how they operate, understand what their needs are, understand what their goals are. And instead of smashing the proverbial square peg through a round hole, really measuring your peg and building a program, utilizing all the different tools that are available and industry best practices, uh, understanding the geographic or, you know, limitations, the laws that are impacting a particular area and putting it all together into a program to which the actual testing part of it, the actual, you know, sample testing is only one small piece uh, of a larger program. So we work with employers all over the country 
uh, both in the federally mandated transportation space and then those that just have a general philosophy of trying to create the safest environment possible, whether that's just testing as part of their application process or so a more robust testing program that could involve things like random testing, um, testing after accidents, forecast testing, things of that nature. So, you know, building those programs out, helping them develop those policies and practices and deal with all those what if situations that many people without, you know, that haven't lived through it might not have thought about that uh, and almost sometimes don't think about it as part of a program like this. So that's really what we do over here at DrugScan. Uh, in the in the DSI world is is build those programs for both the drug and alcohol testing program management as well as our as well as our background screening services. Um, you know, background screening has become uh, you know a hot topic in the world recently, uh, especially you know if you look at what's going on in the in the labor environment where you have you've had a for years now you've had sort of a shrinking workforce as people have, uh, you know, the boomers have started to, you know, leave uh, and there's just not as many new people coming into the workforce. Uh, and so there's, there's been a, a, you know, a labor crunch for a while now, and it's been coming. COVID has certainly accelerated that and shined a bit of a spotlight on it. I mean, you can't even go to, you know, a restaurant now um, without, you know, them telling you, you have an hour wait and you see 17 tables empty is because they don't have staff. You know, you've seen a lot of companies limiting their hours because they don't have staff. You've seen, you know, probably your own business, you know, struggling to, you know, find applicants and, and everyone that you find has got, you know, multiple job offers. Um, so, you know, how do we, how do we take this, these tasks that are, that are there, like, uh, you know, screening an employee and how do we, you know, make it an asset to a company? So we use terms like, uh, applicant experience, right? You know, if uh, if an applicant, you know, if it's too hard for an applicant to, you know, get everything that they need so that you can do a background check or a drug test, you know, they're going to end up going with somebody else who it makes it, it makes the process easier. And then the second term that we use a lot is speed to hire, right? Like, how do we, how do we get the best information in your hands, help you make the decision as quickly as we can to get that person working and, and making you money or, or filling, you know, filling that seat or filling that, filling that need. Um, so we spend a lot of time talking to employers about, you know, how to build a program that does that. The other thing that we spend a lot of time talking to employers about when it comes to the background checks is changing the way that they've maybe thought about it. Uh, for years, I mean, it, it's been a it's been an evolving philosophy for a long time. You, you know, you used to say, you know, we're not taking anybody with anything that shows up on their on their record. Just just you know, flat out bright line rules. You know, line in the sand. And then through uh, organizations like the EEOC and some laws and some case law, you know, they've had to maybe look at things a little bit differently and and look at more of like the job relatedness of it. And you know. Um, Look more specifically at you know what the issue was that they had in the past, and and make some you know make a little deeper decision on an applicant at that time. Well, in this world where there's a, a labor shortage and and uh, uh, everything else going on, it's forced employers to really you know take a, yet another swipe at how they how they think about how they utilize the information on a background check. You know, like. Instead of saying, well, we don't take felonies, but we'll consider misdemeanors. It's like, okay, well, what was the felony? Well, even that, even within that felony, it's like, yep, you know, we need more information. You know, did that person, you know, how long ago, you know, was it? What has that person done since? Has that person held a job, you know, for multiple years? You know, have they, um, you know, ha have they, you know, what other information can that applicant bring to the table to show them that they're not a risk, that they have, you know, change their ways that the, that they have completely rehabilitated, and because you know, no two people are are equal, and and no two people come from the same situation, and you know, and no two scenarios are exactly the same. So you know, how do we find that next level of information um, that will help say, you know what, you know, even though this person may have made some mistakes, there's still somebody that I want to that that I think would be successful, you know, within our organization. And, you know, because you don't want, you never want background checks and the use of background checks to create a, you know, an unemployable segment of the labor market out there because, you know, frankly, 
many organizations can't afford to to pass on th those types of stuff. So how do we equip them to make the best decisions where they're not putting, uh, you know, their organizations at risk? Uh, you know, they are doing the right thing for society. They are helping people that you know that uh, deserve to be helped, and um, you know, making the best decisions possible, having all of the information, whereas maybe again it wasn't that way in, in years past. So those are the types of things that I do and that we can help do uh, here at DSI um, that just takes what drug scan does and our overall philosophy and just takes it another level deeper to be able to provide some additional services to our, our uh, employer client base. Um, so there's my little commercial there. With that, I, I'll turn it back over to Jeff and uh, see if there's any questions from the group. Thank you, Matt, uh, and thank you, Aaron. And again, if anyone has questions, uh, please go ahead and, and pose them in the Q&A um, section uh, of, of the WebEx. Uh, but I'll throw out a question or two until we get any any others from the attendees. You know, Aaron, Aaron and, and Matt, I'd love to hear from you. What have you guys seen in the way your clients have changed their approach to COVID testing uh, over the course of this pandemic, have you have you seen sort of any any shifts in attitudes or or, or the approaches that, uh, that that organizations are employing? Yeah, so I, I can answer that. Um, you know, it's interesting. Like when, when the pandemic first hit, everybody was kind of scurrying. Do we do rapid tests? Do we do PCR? Are we going to do? Um, look for antibodies if somebody had it and you know it, it's like one week we we're rapid next week we we're pcr and then we we're going to go f full on with you know testing people to see if they had the antibodies you know so i think a lot of it has settled down on the pcr testing just from the accuracy standpoint i have a you know i'll use kind of what a lot of my base is, I have a lot of uh, long term care facilities and I have a lot of treatment centers and initially they were like, oh, well, we want the instant result. And what would happen is they would use it. Uh, they think that the patient was negative and um, especially with treatment centers, they would let them go on to the um, main unit floor and they were actually positive, but the rapid test didn't capture that. So next thing you know, they had a major outbreak. So they have pivoted more to the PCR. They're willing to wait an extra day to get a more accurate result. Does that answer your question, Jeff? Yeah, for sure. Cool. That's just kind of real, real world results that I'm that I'm seeing. Yeah, now, I mean, there are some instances where they want an instant, instant result. I, you know, I always say, you know, that's fine. Do the instant result, but always back it up with a PCR test just in case. Yeah, and, and just to build on Aaron's point, um, you know, looking at it through the lens that that I do, you know, working with employers, you know, really what it what I see a lot is is that employers just don't really know where to start, what to do, you know, what are other companies doing? How do I interpret this, you know, thousand page regulation, that, you know, that's out there? What am what can I do? What can I do? What technology is out there? And um you know, so, you know, really trying to find a way to help, you know, they're, they're starving for information. Um, there's, you know, they want to do the right thing. They certainly want to comply with whatever rules are. They certainly want to do right by their employees and their staff and they and their customers and, you know, and whatever the other stakeholders are within that organization. And it's and it's been a lot of sort of scurrying around in the dark, um, you know, through this process is, you know, we've never, we've, you know, we've never encountered anything like this before. So I find that, I find that piece interesting, Jeff, as, as we've watched this happen over the last 20 or so months. Yeah. And, and uh, to Matt's point again, you know, a lot of, a lot of my customers, they don't know what they don't know. Right. So I had a customer, uh, a treatment center that we um, work with quite a bit and it was taking their current lab uh, five, six days to get it back. And they thought that was actually good. And so I was, I had a conversation with them two weeks ago and told them, you know, hey, I could get you guys results next day. And so it's, it's, it's always good to ask to see what else is out there because um, you get a lot of these bigger labs that just can't handle the capacity. Um, we actually can actually handle the capacity quite a bit. We picked up a customer that sends us about 2000 specimens a day. That was just one customer. So 
from a capacity standpoint, we can we can definitely take on the volume and, and, and still not and still get the results out in a timely manner. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting that you mentioned too that that you know um, employers, many organizations are are struggling just to understand all the uh, the the regulations. And, uh, you know, we're, and we're finding that even with some of the largest, most sophisticated organizations, we met recently with our uh, advisory board, which is comprised of uh, occupational health physicians. Uh, and, and they were telling us that, um, you know, hey, we, we have, you know, huge legal and regulatory teams. And, and, and of course, you know, as, as OC health professionals, we're, you know, we're, we stay on top of all of this, but, you know, it, it has changed with such regularity and in many cases the guidance that we're getting is conflicting isn't necessarily well thought, thought out doesn't always match up with the science um you know in many cases you'll get one agency telling you one thing and another uh, agency telling you another thing and it's just uh, it's all but impossible to uh uh, you know, to navigate. So uh, that's certainly been an issue. That That is one common thread is it's, uh, you know, I, I kind of say we're kind of in the wild west, right? You know, it's just, we're on the front lines and every day is different. Well, you know, back to, back to this topic of, uh, uh, you know, we talked earlier about the, about the vaccine mandates. And as I said, we've seen some clients of ours that, you know, oh, well, absent a mandate, you know, especially if I'm not a you know, not a not a healthcare facility. Um, we can scale back on testing because it's no longer going to be you know part of the mandate strategy. So, what would your advice be to organizations that are thinking, oh, we 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 don't have to worry about testing anymore? Um, you know, I I have um, great question. I have a, a couple that we had that conversation about and vaccine mandate or no vaccine mandate you still still want to test right um because the last thing you want to do is have an outbreak and then now you have to shut your facility down you know it's the government and, and payers are reimbursing it so it's uh, really you know there's no cost being thrown over you know the insurance only pays you know a certain amount and then the, you know the, the patient has to cover it. it's it's 100 percent covered which is unique Usually, insurance co companies don't want to cover anything, um, but you know they 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 have implemented just rigorous testing. You know, and I keep going back to what I know, right? My long-term care facilities and my treatment centers they 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 have robust testing processes in place, and it's helped them, you know, navigate major major outbreaks now had they backed down from the testing they would have had major outbreaks so um they've just continued forward with these testing protocols yeah and to, to build on aaron's point that in the in the question that you asked jeff i mean one of the you know as far as mandate or no mandate um i mean certainly i mean what was the purpose of the mandate is they you know they want employers to be testing they you know they want employers to be concerned about you know, creating, you know, those those safe environments for, for people to come to work. I mean, Aaron touched on it a little bit, like, you know, if you have an outbreak at work, you know, that's that can be business threatening for, for a lot of companies that are out there when, you know, if you have 30% of your workforce out, you know, because they have to quarantine or whatever, you know, and the other piece that we really don't know yet, um, and, you know, we and we won't for a while is, is, you know, do employers when they choose to do nothing, Right. I mean, if they just say, bury, I'm going to bury my head in the sand. I know this is an issue that's out there. There are easy solutions out there. We're just going to choose not to. Does does that create any liability? You know, if somebody were to, you know, get sick, if somebody were to, you know, become disabled or, or you know, God forbid, die. You know, we don't know. Right. Um, you know, we can look at it through, you know, other similar type things. Um, you know, we don't want to um you know we don't want to um you know uh sorry i lost my word here you know but but you know when we look at it, an applicant you know we don't want to make decisions about their past you know we just you know we need them in there we're not going to look for this information we're not going to drug test we're not going to you know do do discriminate we're not going to discriminate based on these types of things well, you know, 
th there are lots of lawsuits that go out on negligent hiring and, you know, should you have known and could you have known and how easy is it for you to get access to that information? Um, and it's, you know, it's really created a whole cottage industry of, of, you know, lawsuits and, and, uh, you know, ambulance chasing lawyers. We don't know what's going to happen, you know, with that. I mean, it's certainly something that potentially could, could come down the road. Um, so as an employer, like, you know, do you want to, you know, how, what is your philosophy on that? And I think that's one of the questions that employers have to ask themselves. Gotcha. Yeah, and, and you know, it's interesting. You 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 mentioned the, uh, uh, you know, I think if an employer does nothing and 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 you know doesn't have the ability to show, um, you know, good faith efforts to manage through this, that's where you can get into into trouble. I know for us as for Enterprise Health, as we realized that that we would be subject to the to the safer federal agency mandate um you know had it gone forward uh you know as we as we dug into that and worked with our you know legal counsel to to figure out what you know what do we have to do and and um you know how do we how do we manage all of this and one of the things that became very clear was you know you you really have to demonstrate a good faith effort and and that's part of what we told our employees. We said, look, we, you know, we we need to understand, you know, everyone's vaccination status, and and you know, and 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 if you're not vaccinated, you know, there there are exemption pathways, uh, but part of this is, you know, we we have to be able to show that we put in place a good faith effort to uh, to navigate all of this. So so you know, and again, as we said, the, the, these are the same things that our clients are having to. Uh, Having to wrestle with, so we have to do it as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. One one other question, um, and and you you know you 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 brought up that already that um, you know like turnaround time on results has been an issue, and and I know we always hear from our clients when they talk about you know uh, about lab vendors, you know they they kind of point to the obvious things like you know well we we consider costs, we consider accuracy, we, we consider turnaround time when we're selecting a lab partner. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering, has how has COVID maybe affected uh, some of these criteria, and 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 are there you know other considerations that organizations should should be looking at, you know, in 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 light of this pandemic or overall? I know I know one of the things you met, uh, you mentioned was um, just just capacity, uh, but you know, but what what other what other factors should uh, should uh, businesses be thinking about when they select a lab? Yeah, um, good question. You know, I think the, the most, I mean, you hit on them, right? The most important ones are, you know, turnaround time, right? And then how easy is the um, collection process? You know, how can I access my results? Um, is it easy? Do they have a, uh, you know, patient friendly web portal where I can get on there and access it? You know, is, am I am I getting those results in a timely manner? Um, and then, you know, because you have a lot of labs that'll tell you, yeah, 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 we'll take it, we'll take it, we'll take it. Well, you know, it now it's taken me six, seven, eight days to get my results. Well, that does me no good because by the time I get my results, I'm out of quarantine. So what's the point of doing it, right? So, you know, that's kind of where drug scan steps in and, and, and says, look, we can give you quick turnaround time, uh, cost effective and um, easily, you know, our web platforms accessing results is, is super simple so you know um, and we make the collection process easy so you know when employers think oh you know i've got a test oh man this is going to be hard now it, it's it's actually you know we can come in and train whoever needs to be trained it's super simple just a quick nasal pharyngeal swab you put it in a tube ship it off we get it next day you should have your results within nine hours um, you know, and, and that's big, um, I actually flipped a couple customers over to us and they were blown away at how quick they were getting their PCR testing, uh, results back, which is, which is huge. You know, you know, you, you want those results as quickly as possible. So then you can determine, okay, this person has to quarantine or no, this, this patient doesn't, um, again, you know, I keep using current customers of mine, I had a treatment center that got really relaxed on their COVID testing and they had two outbreaks. And what that does is now they can't take on any new um, patients coming into their treatment center because they're on a lockdown for an extended period of time. So, 
and at the end of the day that that hurts them from a revenue standpoint so um, they learned that lesson uh, real quick and um, got more involved in a more robust um, <clears throat> uh, testing regimen. Yeah, I mean, I th I think um, just looking at things from my perspective as an employer, when you consider it, is you know, some of the employers that I've talked to, they they keep they continue to think of it through the framework of what the mandate would have required them to do, and and then it becomes like, well, I. I I can't do that, or I don't want to do that, or that, that, you know, that's too much. And it's, well, you know, in the absence of the mandate, you actually have more ability to be creative in, you know, what you build for your, you know, for your testing or for your organization. So, you know, it could be as simple as, you know, we, we want to just give our employees access to tests because, you know, if they if we leave them to their own devices because somebody that they worked with you know tested positive and they want to know they don't really know where to go you know and it could take forever to get a result but as the organization if they could sponsor a way for somebody to get you know tested quickly and get the results fast as aaron pointed out they can you know get that peace of mind and get back to work and you know and then you reduce the amount of you know contact tracing quarantining that has to get done and um, you know, exposure quarantining that, you know, still happening in many employers, uh, you know, around the country right now. So, you know, maybe isn't, you know, test everybody who's not vaccinated every week, like the mandate would have been, but it could be like, hey, we've had a positive, you know, our contact tracing is going to require a test for these three employees. Um, so, you know, you can, you can really just sit back and, and say, like, how do, what, do, what do we want to do? What, what, what can we build? What, what makes sense for our organization and build something around that? Yeah. Aaron, and, would you agree with that? Yeah, I was going to say, you make a great point. I, I think the the basis of that is there's just a lot of confusion, right? You know, where do I go? What what, what test do I use? And, and so basically what, what we're here for is to help you guys in whatever you need, right? Do you need a quick test? Would you prefer a PCR? You know, I, I have a lot of people that are around me personally and you know they have a, an outbreak in the house and that like they, they have no idea where to go they can't go to walmart they can't go to cvs they're out they're out you know it just gives you it just gives you know your your employers just a ease of mind knowing that okay well hey we've got drug scan as an option to help us if we decide that we need to offer testing to our employees we can we can develop a, a program that best suits what you guys need. We're not going to dictate and tell you what you did, what to do. We'll help you accomplish what you need to do. Gotcha. Okay. Well, and and thank you guys. I know, uh, you know, so and, and so much of what we've been talking about, and 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 most of our webinars over the last eighteen months have have sort of been uh, focused largely on COVID, uh, really obviously out of necessity. Uh, we look forward to the day where where that's not kind of the 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 driving force for a lot of this content, uh, and we can you know maybe go back to talking about routine testing. But I will say it was really interesting that you guys you you brought up sort of the great resignation, um, and and the impact that that's having on hiring, and and you talked a little bit about some of the things that you guys do uh, around you know uh, drug and alcohol screening and 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 just pre employment screening. Uh, so I'll use that just to pitch uh, for everybody uh, our next webinar. And in, in addition to these longer form webinars where we bring in clients and partners to talk, uh, one of the things that we've heard is, is uh, people would love to have some just shorter webinars that are very specific about, um, you know, uh, some of our functionality. So we've got one, uh, uh, ironically, coming up here on February 23rd uh, from 1 to 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, some of the ways that uh, we're simplifying the management of random drug and alcohol testing uh, within the enterprise health platform. Um, and, and and again, most of our clients are doing pre-employment screening. Most of them are doing you know randomized testing. And um, and uh, over over the years, we've we've received a lot of feedback from our client community on how we could improve that capability within our product. We've recently made some uh, uh, some new uh, development changes and done a little bit of innovation work, uh, R and D work, and uh, so we're going to uh, 
uh, uh, spend some time just demoing and talking about that capability and then and then answering questions. So uh, we'll be sending out um, registration information and promotion of that webinar coming up here um, uh, very soon. But um, you know we're we're right at the hour mark, and uh, and again uh, I know we had ninety minutes allocated, but we also recognize everybody is still very very busy these days. Anybody involved in occupational and employee health, so we'll wrap a little bit early. But uh, again, want to thank uh, um, the the folks from uh, from Drug Scan, Aaron and Matt. Uh, really really appreciate your time and your comments. And as always, thanks to everybody who uh, who attended today's webinar. Um, you know, we we uh, recognize your time is valuable, and we appreciate you spending some of it with us. Uh, and again, we will uh, we will send out a link to uh, to a recording of this uh, here within the next few days. So thanks everybody, and please stay uh, stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks.